Good afternoon, members. <clears throat> and <laughs> afternoon, members. There's a feeling of uh, end of term about this, I think. <laughs> One or two problems. Yeah, and welcome to uh, the meeting of children, young people, and lifelong learning uh, committee committee, <laughs> which is meeting on Monday rather than Thursday, the 12th of December. And I just remind uh, members that uh, this proceedings will be recorded and will be available to uh, the public uh, subsequently. And can I welcome Jeanette Wilson, who's the new church representative um, on the uh, the committee? You've Pick quite a, uh, a bulky uh, agenda to join us on. Uh, Lucy, you want to hear her talk us through? Could we just welcome the new member from the gallery as well, Councillor Hislop? <laughs> if you look at the front page. <laughs> welcome, Ivan. <laughs> Lucy, do you want to take us through the um, set of apologies? Good afternoon, everyone. We have 22 members present. We are Corat. And so far, I've got apologies from Councillor Diggle and Elaine Dennis. Are there any other apologies? Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Witts. Okay, anyone else? Um, okay, Councillor Meal, Councillor Martin. And George Jameson are not present, but maybe along later in the meeting. Councillor Martin is not on the committee anymore. Move that. Just confirm we now have 23 members present. Um, the chair's just asked me to remind the committee that in relation to item nine, that the parent teacher and religious reps um, can, can remain in the room but can't take part in the discussion or in any votes. Or just for clarification, it's beyond item 9. Up until item 9 is all education. After that, it's the wider simple agenda. Thank you. So do we have any declarations of interest? No. Nope. In that case, can we move to item three, the minute of the meeting of the 29th of September 2016? Would you happy with that? Okay. So if we move to item four, which is on uh, page seven, the annual performance report, school meals service 2015-16. There's an update on update, etc. And we have Alan Mawson to speak to. Thank you, Chair. Just through yourself, just a quick overview, if that's okay. I think the, the paper presented to yourselves today, members, it shows continued growth in both sectors of school meals, with a special note being taken on the success of P1 to P3 free meal uptake. The service is continuing to develop and look at new ways of, to deliver, and we'd ask members to note that the growth levels are an officer's opinion almost at saturation, and this is confirmed by the last few years' growth patterns becoming smaller and smaller. However, this year's trading has been positive, especially with paid meals in secondary sector, with the positive trend and ongoing development of the service uptake in all areas will hopefully continue to grow, especially in the free school meals sector in secondary, that will see specific promotion as we move forward this year. The paper also highlights in 3.3 .3 that P1 to P3 uptake is exceeding the predicted 75% by a, an increase of 14%. This increase in uptake is currently not putting pressure on any of the budgets allocated, and this is due to the income received from paid meals and the high productivity that staff deliver in their units. As highlighted, the current funding for this group is under review and will be finalised in the new financial year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members? Jim? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's the appendix on the second, appendix two in the secondary uptake. 
Uh, it's good to see that there's as big an uptake on the free school meals. However, if you look at the next column, the total uptake as a percentage of the school role, and you look at Stranraer Academy, it's at the lowest at 32%. Uh, I think officers will probably know what's coming now. It's probably little wonder that Stranraer Academy has the lowest uptake, considering it has one of the smallest, given the size of its school role, of dining rooms. Now, I've heard on more than one occasion that Stranraer Academy has got the biggest dining room uh, in the school PPP or PPI in the Fries and Galloway. doesn't surprise me. Stranraer Academy is the biggest school. I've also been told about it having the fourth biggest dining room in PPI schools in Scotland. Probably, again, wouldn't it surprise me because Stranraer Academy is probably one of the bigger schools. But the fact is, for the size of school, Stranraer Academy's dining room is too small. The parent teachers are, are of that opinion. I'm of that opinion, and I think every other member that covers the Stranraer area is of that opinion. Uh, when are we ever going to see the uh, Stranraer Academy school pupils to actually get up to the sort of uptake that other schools are getting? Claire, would you like to uh, respond? If I can respond on the PPP side, um, we are in discussions with um, the school and the parent council um, regarding um, looking at making sure we maximise and support the dining offering. Um, the, the school does have the largest dining room region, not just in terms of size, but in terms of proportion for the number of pupils. So it is commensurate with the size of the school. We are looking at the operational issues because we feel there's opportunities in terms of doing um, a number of sittings because it is the one school in the region that only does a single sitting. But what we do feel is important to work with the learners um, and we've established a working group to um, ensure that their views are supported in terms of how we maximise the dining experience. And that is about providing a dining experience, also providing the social experience around it. So um, I would I would say to the member in return that you know we do have a dining room proportionate with the size and number of pupils, both in the region and across Scotland, and we are actively working with all the relevant users to maximise that. Yes, yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I'm glad to hear that... Uh, there's work ongoing with the school to try and solve the problem. Uh, I'll reserve right on the size of the dining room to the size of the, the school, but just one one comment that you made there, that uh, it's the only school in the region doing one sitting. Is that the only PPI school or the only school? There could be a slight difference there. I just want to be really sure of my facts. Is it, it is the only school in the region that's doing a single thing. Um, my focus has been on the PPP today, PPP today in terms of we know it's only PPP school that's doing one sitting. I'd have to look and do a further review against other schools across the region and the specific circumstances as well. I think it's only fair that you look at the, you know, the, the, the design of the school and how the school operates to understand that better. Ivor? Chair, it's with regard to We've got primary one children, we've got primary seven children in the same uh, catering facility, each getting the same sort of portion. Is there a lot of food waste from smaller children because of the fact they can't take the uh, same size of portion as a big one? Because that might be somewhere that if we're looking in the future could make a wee bit of savings or something like that. Yeah, through yourself, Chair. I think it, we, we try, we've tackled that over the, the last the last four or five years. I think proportionally we've gave we've gave the the, the authority back to the units to, to to manage that at the catering end. We've 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 slashed food waste over the last two or three years with pre-order systems that we've done with that. So we've brought that in. Um, I don't think it would be prudent for us to to put any financial value in further further cutting that back, Chair. Ronnie. No, I was just picking up on uh, Jim's point and whether there's any correlation between the distance from the town centres. I'm thinking about, you know, Dumfries High School is 36%. Um, St. Joseph College is 40%. I know that a lot of people use the, the town and the, the cafes round about there. Um, I would just wonder if there's any correlation with that and maybe the figures in Stranraer as well because, uh, you know, it's quite a low percentage as well, 36%. But... Yeah, Chair, I think 
It's a relevant point. I think further in the paper, I think it's worth highlighting that we've, uh, we've employed a provenance chef this year as part of the Dumfries and the, and the Dumfries Academy strategy, and that is to, to look at, for better terminology, look at how we, we tackle it with street food so that we can actually keep more pupils in, and that model seems to be going reasonably well at the moment and is showing an increase in, in income. Uh, that model, once completed this financial year, will be looked at being rolled out to more of the towns so that we can start to compete with the uh, Beyond the School Gates. Can I just ask, um, in terms of moving to the 1140 hours um, early learning and childcare, what pressures is that going to put on the surface, both in production terms, but also serving the uh, the youngsters? I think, Chair, just just it's a, a valid point at the moment. We met, met with our colleagues in uh, in that and from education only last week. On the back of that, at the moment, it's not putting it doesn't put any pressure on the service delivery at all. I think the the phased approach or, or rolling that out across the next two or three years, it might might see some some added pressures on. But I think the service is is well set up to deal with that. Um, however, you know, capacity within them areas, any additional building works is not, not within the remit of what we do. But certainly from a production side. Uh, we, we think we're in we're in a reasonable enough place to to cope with that. Ivan, chair, it's just been the likes of the schools there. Are any of the schools operating? Uh, you're not allowed out of uh, the grounds. I know St Joseph's. I think first and second year, you're kept in. Uh, how does that actually affect your figures? Because if you took the ones who are banned from going rather than a sort of free choice. Um, because one of the big issues falls back on the same issue that was at uh, Stranra was the queuing that takes place to actually get into St Joseph's. Uh, that's why a lot of the kids actually do go down the street because they can't physically get through the uh, lunch queue in time. Chair, valid point again. I think where we are with that is that we're, we're trying to deal, one, we've launched pre-orders in quite a lot of the schools that allows them to pre-order morning break and then pick up at lunch, and that, that has helped. The schools, certainly the schools in Locker Bay is an example, keeping up to S3, and it certainly adds a lot of dimension on, on that, but then the added pressure is how do we deal with them queuing systems. The key behind it and the success behind all of them that are successful is the head teacher working and, and looking at how we actually deal with that. And it's not so much, back to a valid point at the beginning, staggered lunches, but, but phasing them lunches and who can come in and, and rotating them round about. So, yes, I think, you know, I think the capacities in, in all secondary schools is, would be an issue if all, all years were kept in. And I think there definitely is a growth pattern of sustained uptake and income if, if they are kept in. Uh, however, I think working, the key is working in partnership with the head teacher, and that seems to be manageable, even if up to S3 being, being a captive audience. Jim? Thanks, Chair. How do we identify pupils entitled to free school meals? Thanks, Chair. That's done through our colleagues in, in education who do that through the criteria, depending on what, what they apply for, whether it's a clothing grant or some other grants that they do that. Once identified within that system, then the, the free school meal, as an example, then is offered to them. So the onus is on the parent to put in an application, is that correct? Gillian? Yes, the onus is on the parent, but we've been working closely with the school offices and the principal teachers of guidance as part of the council's anti-poverty strategy. One of the actions was to be very proactive in supporting families make the applications that, from which they're entitled. So we will group call parents, we will support parents filling in the forms, we will look, this year we've looked at all the families who are moving from P7 to S1 and if they've been entitled <coughs> to free school meals in primary seven, why have they then not applied in S1? And that's been the task of the principal teachers of guidance in S1 to work through the families to make sure that all people who are entitled to a free school meal actually take that entitlement. Because it doesn't just have to be lunchtime, the youngsters can have mid-morning break. If they still want to go down the street at lunchtime, they can use the free school meal entitlement for um, a snack in the morning, if should they choose. Does this have an implication for a funding relating to a, you know, basically 
disadvantaged pupils. You know, the, the Scottish Government funding. Yes, uh, the Scottish Government funding is based on the number of um, the, the number of people who apply for free school meals, and therefore we, it's also been useful for us to be proactive because the staffing formulas for our schools are based on the number of young people who are entitled to free school meals. So if you've got a lot of youngsters in your school who are not entitled, who are not applying, then it's to your benefit to make sure that they do. So if, if the parents fail to put in an application, they could be disadvantaging the school. Thank you. Chair, if I, if I could just add to that, I think that the overall summary is that it's, we think it's in parents' interest to apply. It's in the, the local authority education department's interest that parents apply, but we're always recognising the sensitivity that ultimately an individual in society can choose not to apply. Con? Thank you, Chair. I'm just going back about three or four years at DG First Committee, we were asked to spend some money on um, catering vehicles, which were to be used for emergencies, flooding, etc. But also, if I remember rightly, they were to try and entice pupils to stop going down the street, going to the burger or the chip shop, and selling healthy alternatives from these vans. Were these ever implemented? Because I can't remember hearing anything else about them. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, the Cafe, D, the Cafe DG vans were, were implemented. Um, Langham, Sanka, where I had a trial in there with them, spent a good period of time. Uh, St. Joseph's College, Shunrar Academy. Uh, obviously, putting them vans on required additional staffing costs. Uh, didn't justify the existence of them for the simple reason for where we are. One was the, the size of the, the vans that we had, um, but more importantly, the product that we could sell was the same as the dining room. Now we looked at that and we're currently re-looking really at that at the moment um, with the flexibility around offering alternative back to the, the, the model that we're looking at in Freeze High and Freeze Academy with the Provenance Chef. But they were well utilised within, I think it was about eight schools that we would seem to know them um, and the viability of them wasn't sustainable. Chair. I've got no one else indicate no one to speak so if we can go to the uh, <coughs> recommendations and we note 2.1 and 2.2 and 2.3 and approve the ongoing program 2.4 of development for school meals as detailed at 3.20 and given that this is um, a continuing success story could I make a suggestion that we actually commend the staff involved in them um, the continuous uh, improvement in uptake and in the quality of food and in ensuring that as many youngsters as possible do exercise their uh, entitlement for free school meal. Yep. Okay, thank you. So if we move to uh, item five, which is on page 25, this is uh, Increasing Galloway Education Authority response to the Scottish Government consultation, empowering teachers, parents and communities to achieve excellence and equity in education, a, a governance review. And as it says uh, within the paper, the closing date for our submission is the 6th of January 2017. So uh, we still do have time to add or to uh, modify the uh, uh, submission. Uh, Gillian, do you want to say anything? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this the review, the governance review has attracted a lot of national attention, so I'm sure it will be familiar to members. There are 17 questions, and just for clarity, I've included all the questions in the proposed response, although it was quite challenging to put a draft response to all the questions because there's quite a lot of duplication. So perhaps if members wish to add anything to the response or to any of the questions that are not currently responded to, then we can certainly do that. But the broad themes are that the governance of education is complex and getting a balance between local, national and regional governance is it, it's, a it's a complicated business. It gives us an opportunity to build on what we're good at and I think there has been a lot of discussion about the regionalisation agenda. So I don't know how uh, we want to um, pursue this, whether we want to go through them question by question or... Uh, people just indicate if there's anything uh, they want to uh, 
to add to any of the uh, the questions or indeed the uh, the format. So, uh, Ronnie. Just listening to what Johnny was saying, I know there's 17 questions and it is quite complicated and uh, you know, getting duplication perhaps. Um, it, it lists a series of the 17 questions and there is possibilities in there that might some of the answers might be misinterpreted uh, the way it's laid out. Um, I don't know if it would be helpful if the response is maybe structured around a, a series of key themes. Uh, this would ensure the maximum impact and uh, you know, the, the questions being answered without actually putting in a in that kind of format. You know, it would enable us to highlight the co connectivity, if you want, between the, some of the themes within that. So I don't know whether it would be helpful, you know, whether it would be a themed response rather than a, a purely 17 question response. I'm happy to do that. The themes were very much on regionalisation, GIRFEC, funding, decision making at a school level. So there are broad themes that become slightly repetitive in the way that I've structured it. So I would be happy to reshape that with the same thrust. Like. That's what, yeah, I think it'd be, it might be more helpful. It might be helpful for, for yourself as well and for, and for to get the proper messages across. Nick? I was just going to make a general point on I'm just going to say that I welcome the part to take part in Mr. Swinney's positive and open debate. I think we all believe that the success of our education system depends on the quality of the teaching and the exercise of clear and effective leadership. I think we all agree that. I think we all want to empower our teachers to make the best decisions for children and young people. And that decisions about children's learning and school life should be taken within schools themselves, supported by parents and local communities. And uh, I think that we all agree with that, whether well, this is the best way to improve ch ch children's uh, attainment in school. I don't know whether perhaps we should be concentrating on the curriculum and how we're delivering uh, uh, curriculum for excellence. But other than that, probably be a more positive use, but I think we should take part in it. I've only got a couple of comments to make, really, on the chip. We're in an English teacher, page 58, question five, the first the first sentence isn't a sentence because it's not it's not complete. I think there's a few other typos in the thing, and I think I think w cluster working within this authority has been a big success. But I don't think we sort of uh, uh, really mentioned it properly in our submission. I think there's one question that mentions cluster working, and I think if we could sort of see how, what the benefits of cluster working and how perhaps that could be. Developed even even more would be a good would be a good thing. Okay, happy one. Yeah, I think it has been a, a big strength of uh, education in in our authority that we have persuaded schools to work more closely together. I think uh, Dumfries Learning Towns probably the biggest example, but we also have the Network East as well, where they it's sort of a spontaneous cooperation between schools in order to uh, achieve more with less effectively, which is the situation we're in. So I do think that's does need to be, I know it is uh, actually within the, uh, the submission. Um, Rob? Thank you, Chairman. I've moved in order to try and um, confuse you. I see it hasn't worked. Um, I think it's a very fair draft, actually, and it strikes a good balance. Um, and I'm interested in what the leader says about perhaps redrafting on a thematic approach, because the questions that I had were primarily about what particular paragraphs meant, because I could understand the paragraphs around them, and in all cases, I had a fairly reasonable idea of what I thought you were getting at, but I wasn't entirely sure. And it may very well be that that has simply been a product of trying to both cover everything, but also avoid some of the duplication that's maybe inevitable. Um, so rather than going to the particular paragraphs as I, uh, that I was going to ask you what they meant, um, my question instead would be, if there is to be a redraft, um, how is that going to work in terms of member scrutiny ahead of the deadline for submission? Julian? Okay. Uh, I would propose that I take some governance advice regarding that. I certainly can have a, a redraft completed in the next couple of days and then be sent round to members. There's also an early learning and child care uh, consultation response, which we're also going to have to deal with in a similar fashion. So it's possible we could do both at the same time. 
Ronnie? No, that's fine. I, it was just a, you know, it wasn't any stifling debate or anything like that around the, the whole the thematic approach within, you know, within all the questions because there are a lot, a lot of answers in in these questions, but some of them are duplicated, as you said. Some of them are a bit blurred. Some of them, but you know, um, it's just to try and pull all that together into the th thematic response to make it clearer, to make it, you know what we actually want to achieve uh, from the council. So, yeah, within these questions, you can get the, the information, you know, uh, and whether that has to come back or whether we trust you to do that, you know, within all the responses we get here. Chair, I wonder if I could make a suggestion. If, if, if members are minded that at the moment it's a fair draft in terms of, and, and reasonably balanced in terms of what's been written, then if Gillian's just to basically take what's already there, put it into the themes, send it out just for your information, and if there's anything glaring that any individual member wanted to write back to her, we could take that on board. But if you felt at the moment, in general terms, it was fair, then it would be a matter of just redrafting the current spirit. Yeah, I think it's to, to try and get that, you know, it's with, without adding a duplication, with, with giving more explanation within that, giving it, uh, a stronger, uh, you know, th theme if you want, presence. But Are members happy with that proposal? Yeah. I think just in terms of uh, the uh, the regionalisation idea, I don't think we should get fixated on sort of geographic regionalisation. And, uh, um, we should have more flexibility into any regional proposals than than just who we park next to by uh, uh, an accident of uh, geography. Right. So uh, I've got no one else to indicate, Brian. I think you're right on that point. I think you're absolutely right. You know, focus on the improvement is, you know, it's um, it's welcome, but you know, it's 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 where the, if there's an enforcement to do it, seeing a certain solution within it. I think there's a there is a natural partnership between the local authorities, and you know, encouraging that further sharing of the, the practice <laughs> and resources and that is helpful. You know, but you know, without that kind of constraints. Okay, members, so if we move to the uh, recommendations in uh, section two, so 2.1, we've uh, considered the draft response, and I think we're all reasonably happy with that. 2.2, uh, agree subject to elect a member comment at the committee meeting that this response be submitted to the Scottish Government by the closing date of 6th of January. Yeah, we've heard the director suggested about how we can actually uh, facilitate that and still hit the deadline, and I think we're all happy to go along with that, yeah? And uh, 2.3, note that CMIS, our proposed response to the consultation, shared this with LLP members, and that's set out at uh, Appendix 3. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. So if we can move to uh, Item 6 on page 67. The 2 to 18 service review, your three recommendations. Julie? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is year three, and the report sets out and highlights the approach that we've taken to take account of a changing landscape nationally and conditions and recommendations on achieving the savings target set out in the initial scope of the 2 to 18 service oh. review. What we've been able to do in bringing forward options for members has been constrained by the changes to the, the national landscape with teacher numbers. This paper puts forward some recommendations that we feel could be managed through efficiencies and managed reductions. But as you can see from the paper, there is an anticipated shortfall to that process. <coughs> members? Rob? Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I'm trying to work out the interrelationship between 2.2 .2 and 2.3. Um, clearly, I understand 2.3 is a shortfall. We will have to look at that in terms of budget proposals. That's understood. Um, the uh, recommendation we're being asked to do at 2.2 .2 is to agree that almost £1 million. Surely that's also a matter for the budget. We're not agreeing it today, we're noting it. 
Yeah, the uh, discussion in our group, that was exactly the same lines we were going down, that uh, why we uh, green 2.2 and 2.3 separately, they're all bu budget um, uh, constraints. Um, and also, I don't think we've got enough information on what the budget savings in are at this point of view. You know, what are we actually doing away with uh, in terms of the uh, the service we're deli uh, delivering? So I'd, my personal recommendation would be that uh, we uh, do away with 2.2. And also, sorry, can, in, in 2.3, we're also constraining ourselves to the possible um, savings in uh, 9.2, whereas we should, you know, each group should be uh, given the freedom to look at savings throughout the uh, the budget rather than uh, a general area. So, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it open to uh, the comment if anybody wants to come in. Richard? Thanks, Chairman. We'll just consider a report on how to bring about excellent excellence and equity in the Scottish school system. But here we are, we're setting a bog standard budget, which is actually going to widen the inequality gap. So. Uh, schools are going to have less money to 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 produce, to to uh, <coughs> have materials for the ch for the children's schools. Uh, we're not going to have the set, we're not going to have the central staff to support them as much as, as we should do. Uh, we're going to <coughs> we're going to uh, just uh, just professional development for teachers, even though we're asking them to take on more responsibilities and be and uh, teach their children uh, more effectively. And I think the, the, one, the, the one part of the budget which does really concern me is the children's integration budget, which is going to be cut by a quarter from 1.13 million to 250,000 pounds. And this, this budget is one which supports the most vulnerable children in our school system. It's the, making sure that we get it right for for every child. It's going to uh, reduce support for uh, looked after children, vulnerable children. And in a later in a later report on the agenda, we we'll learn that children with, who are looked after and more vulnerable children have less positive destinations than the th other children who leave school. So it's really worrying. And I don't think we have enough information in the report to make a decision on the, that budget because there's no impact assessments and how, or re really any detailed information how this is going to work. So I don't think we can agree with that report at this stage, but we need more information and we need a, an impact assessment on how that's going to affect children. Thanks, Chair. Um, could, could I certainly, just, just so that we're absolutely clear for officer direction then, um, I, th I think I would highlight that officers work under member direction and of course two years ago there was a direction to bring forward the service review in education that would save £3.4 million. Um, what, what's been unfortunate is that we've ended up with a hybrid here because actually we've been unable to carry out a full service review in the way that some others in the council have been um, in the sense that there's been a lot of restrictions and rather than working with a, a £92 million budget to really look at how we redo what we deliver it's really come down to a small budget to look at trying to get savings. And on that basis, it's ended up halfway between a review and a set of budget templates, which you don't actually have here yet. So t taking that on board, I I'm, I'm understanding from what members are saying today that what we would look to do is provide budget templates around the headings here that you've already got in terms of the 0 0.9, and then potentially if, if members request other areas for us to look at, for us to provide budget templates and those also and all together that could be considered as part of the budget setting process recognizing that this report has been delivered to you only three days before the settlement which has brought it very close to budget setting is that the position that we're in i think everybody sorry Ivor, we'll come back to you <clears throat> chair could the director tell us are these savings based on starting on the 1st of April, or are they based on the 1st of August or whenever, the 25th of August, whenever the school year starts? Because is there any knock-on effect by not agreeing a saving now, which means that we have to take a bigger saving because we've got less months to cover the saving over? 
clear, clearly some of, some of the savings relate to what we already know that wouldn't begin until a new term, so that's already built in. There may be a few which would have been from the 1st of April, and clearly if you wait until February to do that, it might only have a month's impact, but it shouldn't be significant. Gail? Rob? Thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it was simply to come back and say, having heard what you and the Director have both said, I think that probably is quite a sensible way forward, um, if you are willing to amend the recommendations along those lines. Jim? Could we have some information on what is meant by staffing remodelling? Um, you'll receive a template on that now based on this agreement. Thank you. Yeah, I think it does highlight the fact that we need a lot more information before we yeah, agree to, uh, to any of these savings. So, but no one else indicating they, they want to speak. So can we move to recommendations? Can we uh, note 2.1 and a suggested to, uh, revised 2.2 or do away with 2.2 and 2.3 and have a revised 2.2 note the current projected shortfall of 1.651 million to be addressed in the budget setting process. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, members. So... We move on to item seven, which is on page 111, the supporting learners service review, which is to provide members with an update on the implementation of supporting learners service review 2014, specifically ongoing work to mitigate the removal of the classroom assistant role and allocation of support, and to highlight challenges in delivering the final tranche of committed savings for 2017 stroke 18. And it's Hugh to speak to. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just to highlight a, a, an error in the report um, for members, that in 2.2, the figure that is referred to as 0.4 million should actually refer to 483,000, which is further um, indicated in the report. So the figure that we're actually looking at in terms of the shortfall uh, of, of savings is 483,000. Just want to bring that to members' attention at this initial stage. In terms of the report that's before you, it's, um, it's highlighting the ongoing um, work that's been undertaken by the supporting learners team to address the, the problems that were, arose from the implementation of the final part of the supporting learners um, uh, service review and effectively the allocation of support for learning staff for this session. Um, that, uh, the report highlights those challenges, how those emerged and also the work that's ongoing in terms of to address those um, it also, I suppose, that, that importantly highlights to members that we, we are looking at a, short, a significant shortfall in the original um, target for the savings for, for the service review of 483,000 and the recommendation in 2.2, which suggests that that should go forward to part of the budget setting process. Um, obviously, we'll take any questions that members have. Okay, members. Ian. Thanks, Chairman. <coughs> Excuse me. I suppose it's quite self-explanatory, the, the, the report, when you read it. So when I got to paragraph 3.13, I just wondered what schools were actually. I don't see them identified within there. Do we need to see that? Do we need to see it now? I would like to see a list of the schools that are affected there, in particular in regards to 3.13, because I've got some pressure on some of my, my own schools. I just wonder if that's one of them. Hopefully it will be. But just, we see it across the board. I see why there's a political decision being advocated and that'll go into the next council thing. But just so, for my own reassurance, I'm taking that if we agree this today, we see all the pressures that are here and how difficult this is going to be ongoing. But the, the, the support that's in place at the moment, there'll be no reduction as it stands until we go into the next financial year, is that, or even after the next term, which I take for the summer holidays on. Is that correct? Absolutely. We continue to work with, with all our schools and, and, and move resources around as best as we can, but those that, the schools that are, continue to require additional support through the, uh, the contingency fund, that will be available. But that's an ongoing process that of engagement with schools, looking at different models that they can use in terms of supporting learning. Um, and, and, but in terms of the overall package of resource, that would continue and be available for the rest of the session. If it's not now, maybe later on, but at 3.13, it refers to different schools within that. If we get that list at some point, maybe later on, an email or something like that, much appreciated. Thank you. Um, 
Robert? Um, just on paragraph 314, when it refers to universal support, does that refer to all three sectors, that enhancement of universal support? In terms of early years and primary and secondary, yes. So it's all, it's all three sectors, all yeah? Three sectors. Is, is it possible to tease that out a wee bit of what it means by universal enhancement? Yeah, we'd have to do that. Okay, thank you. Rob? Thank you, Chairman. I'm looking um, specifically at paragraph 3.7, um, and I think the director's heard me raise the question before. Um, where we talk about the 60% um, the uh, increase in specialist full-time support. Um, I understand that it has happened and it's quantified here, but my question is, how did it happen? That's not ever been particularly clear to me. You? Chair, if I, if I could on this one. Um, what, what's particularly frustrating is that the, the same issue that we reported to you maybe three or four months ago is the one that's been reported just now. Um, we recognised this very quickly after August that this had happened in terms of the allocation. We found it impossible to reverse the allocation until we get into next session because although we think it's uneven, if we were to reverse and change the allocation now, then those people who are currently enjoying support would lose it very short term. Therefore, um, we recognise that it's an ongoing issue that we're reporting. We're taking steps to ensure it doesn't happen again, but we're not able to reverse it midterm. That doesn't quite answer your question, Councillor. The question you've asked is, how did it happen? And really how it happened is that previously, um, maybe we had uh, senior managers who, who would have carried out a moderation activity on the assessment of allocation that came in. We had quite a lot of change at, at the time at Easter last year, and that change included losing part of the reshaping to save money for the council. That included losing three or four very senior managers whose responsibility was to... Uh, um, oversee this process. Now, the new team has tried to get up to speed as quickly as possible. We're not setting out excuses. I'm simply setting out the reason, which is that when that process was carried out in between Easter and the summer this year, there wasn't a full moderation process and it led to some spikes and troughs. And I think that would be fair to say we've learned a big lesson from that, but can't immediately reverse it until next term, or next session, sorry. Jim McCall? No. Nope. Uh, Ivor? Chair, it's 3.7 again. Do, do we see that as being the pattern that will follow this year? Again, another 60% increase. And will we robustly quality assure going forward uh, rather than just, uh, you know, some schools uh, suffering because they didn't get their uh, allocation. And I must admit, I think there's one school in our ward, uh, Chairman, which has suffered at this. And the kids in there, I think they should be getting the stuff. I know we're, we're working towards mitigation, but I think if it was equality or equity, we'd have done this earlier rather than waiting to next session. I think, Chair, I think... Absolutely. I just want to reassure members that we, we have a process in place that will bring back, um, well, we'll introduce the quality assurance that, that was missing last year and the robust mo moderation. What we're keen to do is, is be able to differentiate in terms of the level of needs. So whereas we pre last year asked for one-to-one -one supports, which has been the process in place for the last three years, will be differentiating in terms of that group of children. What level of support do they need? And, and then looking to see, can that support be shared with other children in a similar, with similar needs within the school? So we'll be de developing a much more moderated and much more quality assured process. And I suppose that the key thing is we will have the time this year or this session to be able to take schools through that process and take parents as well and, and, and young people through that process. Because the, the, the reality was the timings and the challenges at the end of last session meant that it was very difficult to be able to communicate all the level of change and the level of process that was happening to all, to all stakeholders. So absolutely, we, we've got a, 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 we've, 
we've learned the lessons. We know what went wrong last year. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't in, with regard to that schools were asked a question and they provided us with that information. It's the, con it's the process of negotiation, really, that, that, that was missed out in terms of the moderation. So we'll bring it, we're bringing that back. We're working with schools. We've been engaging with schools. And we will have a process that will deliver for, for next session a, a robust um, allocation. I have to say, within the context of ongoing challenges in terms of levels of need and, and, and resources that are available, but we will have a process that will be able to identify those children in terms of what hours they need or what levels of support they need, as opposed to just three large groups of children, whether that's universal, targeted, or specialist, which doesn't allow us to, to identify those needs well enough at this stage. Andy? Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I'm, I'm just wondering here uh, if it's the right forum to ask this question, but I, I'm, I'm wondering here, uh, colleagues in the NHS and social work and everything else about the early identification um, has a knock-on effect. And I'm, uh, what I'm really getting around to here is that where are we the assessment stroke diagnosis, depending on what the, uh, the condition of the child is? You know, is there a waiting list? That, uh, are, are we getting through them quicker? Are we getting them in the mainstream system quicker? Um, it, it might be that Hugh or, or Colm kind of give us that today, but that kind of information would be help I would suggest to make it clearer for us exactly where we are in the process. So, um, you know, there was a time, for example, uh, the autistic children, or people in the children on the autistic spectrum, were, there was quite a long waiting list for, uh, for, for diagnosis. I mean, is that still the case, or are we getting through that, or, or, or how is it progressing? Yeah, <clears throat> um, we'd made some improvement there, but then more recently that waiting time has gone up again. Uh, at CSEG at the moment, that's being discussed in terms of getting at least a short-term solution to bring the waiting list back in, and I'll, I'll email information for interested members on that. Robert? Okay, Dick. Oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, you gave an assurance uh, on Councillor Crothers' uh, question that the report will continue for this year at least. I think that's a good thing, but I think it was still in a bit of denial. We were very near the abyss uh, in June when the allocation of uh, support was given out, and lots of vulnerable children ha didn't have that support. They were going to go into the new term without that. Gladly, a good, good, good job that we acted quickly to, to resolve that. But I think. I don't think tinkering with the matrices of need and the moderation will solve that problem because I think we are going to be under capacity next year as well. That's my opinion. Uh, over, th over 30 years ago, Scottish education embarked on the road of integration and inclusion. Special schools were, were closed down and children with complex needs were integrated into the mainstream. They were integrated uh, with support. Now, that support has gra gradually dwindling, and it's really get, been cut over the last last year as well. So uh, uh, I don't think we can tinker around the edges by saying that because some schools have a have a good people-teacher ratio, then that'll help. It will help in the small schools where there are small classes, but in large schools with classes 25 to 30 pupils in them, then I think the mainstream class teacher is going to be, going to be struggling to support that. Even with the extra training, which we're told the, the, the professional development has been cut, that's going to make it even harder for teachers to take on complex duties. Now, we're not talking about children here who maybe have a few spelling difficulties or need a wee bit of help with their reading, but we're talking about children in these classrooms without support who can't read, they can't write, they need, they need support to get through the, cur cur the curriculum. So I think that let's not be in denial. I think we've got to be at the end of the day next year. We might have to say, well, we've got the we've got it wrong. The review is wrong, and we don't have enough support or capacity in the schools to do the job properly for our children. Now, obviously, I th think every school or many schools in the region have been affected by by the reduction in support. And I, I would just I'd like to ask if there are impacts assessments been done at each school throughout the region and whether we could have them, especially for, for the schools within our area, because it's important for us to know what the impact is on children within, within our wards. 
So, <coughs> first of all, Chair, we regularly report on pupil attainment, achievement, participation. Uh, so you'll continue to get that and you can look to see whether we have seen a decrease or an increase in terms of uh, inclusion and participation and attainment. So that will, that will be provided. Secondly, the nature of the way this report has been written does allow for members to make decisions for the future in terms of whether further reductions uh, are deemed reasonable or not. That's for members. I just to ask if the impact assessments for each school can be made available to ward members. Yeah, the, the, those would be the impact assessment is in terms of the attainment, achievement, participation per school, and we can certainly make that available for everyone. It's not possible to make an immediate judgment as to whether there's an absolute correlation in terms of support. But if, if for example, we were sending you out information that was showing that in schools um, attainment was dropping significantly, or indeed uh, exclusion was going up or attendance was going down, you might be able to make that connection. Um, we will continue to send out those monitoring reports for you. I think I think attainment's fine enough, but there are other factors which you've got to judge when you're when you're talking about uh, people with additional support needs. How, how how are they socially integrated into the school as well? Are they they might do well in a test attainment test, but are, are they, are they being bullied? Are they being are they are they socially interact with the rest of the peers? Are they being withdrawn into the learning centre? because there's not enough staff to integrate them into mainstream and give them a, a broad and balanced curriculum. So I think perhaps you, the director could, uh, direct could think of other ways of, we, we could measure how, how the reduction in support is going. I think, I think, again, I'm just a little bit careful in terms of capacity of officers. Um, 2010, there were 24 education officers, there are now six. So one, one of the issues is that we, we by and large have had to look to schools to deliver that, those sort of, that, that sort of service and indeed provide the information for us. It has always been in education that we've used proxy measures in terms of looking at how well schools are doing. Um, we'll continue to do that, but obviously we can have a particular look, um, and I know Hugh's team will be doing that, having a particular look at the sort of measures that indicate levels of inclusion and, and indeed participation of youngsters with need, and we'll try our very best to do that for you. Robert. Thanks, Chair. Uh, in addition to what my colleague here has just said, is it possible with these impact assessments that we could um, differentiate between the pupils who need one-to-one -one support and the pupils who don't need one-to-one -one support but still need one, still need support? It seems to us that uh, the people who are most disadvantaged from all this is the people in the middle who aren't getting any support at all. Is it possible to include an assessment of how that's been affected? I think that presents quite significant challenges because of the number of children that, that fall into that targeted number of children and young people fall into that targeted group. But I think it would be fair to say that the 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 seventy percent of our resource that that's that's working that's supporting children in the specialist one to one means that there has been a squeeze in the middle ground. We also provided a thousand hours of universal support as well. Um, I'm I don't have an immediate sense of how we would be able to look at that in terms of the impact on those children, um, but we can certainly take that away and we'll look at that and and if we can bring something back to members, um, we will. I suppose it would just maybe be worth um, highlighting as well that, that, you know, that we know the biggest difference for children is access to a teacher um, and that one, some of the issues that we've had is, is that the idea that actually the presumption of mainstream means that there needs to be a non-teaching uh, non member of staff that, that, <coughs> that supports a, a, a learner all the time. What we know from some of the research that, that, that in the UK is that actually that, that limits the interaction between the pupil and the teacher uh, and therefore and, and it's a, it's a, a view that that's, that that was pr proposed by um, the research suggested that actually that the idea of the the, the, the member of staff directly supporting the, a young person in class can sometimes actually further disadvantage them in terms of their access to that that teacher interaction. So I suppose we are not just looking at a dip more re at resources; we're also looking at the approaches that we take. And I think that presumption of mainstream does need us to think again in terms of what that looks like in our schools. We have, over many years, moved to a, 
well, we, we've expanded the, the, um, the scope in terms of additional support without necessarily looking at the way that we, we, we provide those supports um, to get to the point where actually we had a significant over um, spend in terms of support um, and not necessarily targeted at all the right children where we can make the biggest difference. So I think that, that in terms of us going forward, there's a, a lot more work that we, that we want to do. This isn't just simply about trying to fix an allocation process. This is us looking again at the way that we deliver supporting learners within our schools and, and, and to those children and where we can make the biggest impact. Andy? Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, I know in the, the corporate governance part that the, um, the, the trade unions, both the, uh, the teaching unions and the support staff unions, are not in agreement with uh, the contents of this report. But I don't see any... Um, I, I see there's an appendix having a meeting that I'm just to clarify. Is that the, uh, the management's uh, view of that meeting? Or where is the uh, the papers from the two uh, the two union bodies that actually would let us consider something? Because if they don't agree with it, we have to value what the staff say, and we can't do that if we don't know exactly what the problem is. Julian, we, we have received written responses from both the EIS and from Unison and Unite, and we certainly have. I've got a meeting later on this week to provide clarification with the non-teaching unions and there have been joint trade union meetings between the Unison Unite and the EIS in recent weeks. Anything you'd like to add? No, uh, other than we're, it's an ongoing work, a, a piece of work with the unions, non-teaching and teaching unions. Um, the, the response from the non-teaching unions was that they're opposed to the service review process from the EIS that was specific issues in relation to obviously the, the pressures that are being placed on teaching staff in schools from, from the, 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 um, the implementation of the service review um, and that we've, we, can, we have an, a process where we're engaging jointly with um, EIS and the non-teaching unions to look at the job description of the learning assistant to clarify roles and responsibilities and to make sure that actually we're all on the same page in terms of understanding what that role is and the expectations of that in the hope that that will actually be able to get us some common ground that, that, um, that the support that we have in place is the right support. It's targeting children's needs, but it's also being able to provide some of that differentiated learning experience that, that, that teachers are providing in school. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, it, it's very emotive, this, and you know, it's, it's, it's very high profile, and there's a lot of emotions running very high about this. And um, I appreciate if we couldn't have in every single council committee agenda item a full response unless it was pertinent. But the, who decides if it's pertinent, you know, and I think uh, on these occasions when it is so um, emotive and that it would be helpful to actually let us see what the, what the initial responses were from the staff sides because after all they're the people who are dealing day and daily face to face with the parents and the children themselves. So um, I think I think just as a learning point, we could maybe do that, Chair, through you. Um, just make sure, if it's something like this, that we include the, uh, the union responses. Julian? I mean, I think the IS actually circulated a, a, um, a briefing to all members. So we at least all have uh, that in our possession. I, I think, uh, uh, yes, we, we, you're, you're right, Chair. But... Uh, I, I think we should be getting a balanced view coming forward in the papers, and if, if, if that's the view, the, the unions themselves shouldn't have to um, uh, effectively lobby individual members. It should be coming forward as part of the consultation process. I think the officers have accepted that. Yeah. Right, can we turn to the recommendation? It's not really so much a question, it's just clarification for governance. I take it when we are agreeing recommendations, we're agreeing recommendations that are actually in the paper and not those recommendations that's actually shown in the agenda. Because if you look at recommendation two on the agenda for this item, it's different from what's actually in the paper. You're right, John. Through, through you, Chair. Um, yes, you're just to agree the recommendations that are set out 
Um, so two point two would be agree that further savings required to meet the anticipated shortfall of zero point four one, etc. Yeah. So what's detailed there? Okay, so can, uh, can we uh, note 2.1 and agree the revised 2.2, the, uh, the figure of uh, 0.483 uh, replacing uh, 0.4? And can we agree to receive a further report on the resource provision admissions policy as detailed in paragraph 319? And can we get, get some sort of indication of when this is liable to uh, be reported back? So obviously it is important that we do make uh, progress in this. We April. So if we move to uh, item eight on page one, two, three, this is the uh, the Dumfries Learning Town update report. Um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, the Dumfries Learning Town is making great progress uh, now and uh, um, obviously we had a uh, recent launch at the Northwest Campus in St. Joseph's uh, uh, as well and um, I'm due I think to go to St. Joseph's on Wednesday this week to have a look to see the progress that's been made in terms of uh, I think it's mainly been demolition work to, to date so uh, hopefully uh, uh, we'll see a, a phoenix rising from the ashes fairly soon. So uh, Claire would you like to do talk us through this one? Um, I think the, um, the paper remains as stands in terms of reporting the positive progress on St Joseph's and North West. Um, with respect to the, the naming aspect on North West Campus, the Stillier Committee did ask us to go back and um, find out further information, so we're going to do that and we'll report back to them early next year and then we'll come back to this committee at a later date. Um, and um, noting progress on the bridges um, as detailed in the paper, so very happy to take any questions. Members? Dick? Yeah, just one question on the page 127 of 500. Common Good and Community Company update. I think I asked a question about the Common Good Fund and their ownership of this land about two or three years ago when we first started this. We never got really get a, an answer to this. Uh, I suppose I won't ask whether it was a, it's a four, five, or six figure sum for the QC's fees. But what happens if we don't get the, pet, the petition that's not successful? Okay. Happy to answer that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there has been a change in um, the land legislation over the summer period, which does permit councils to um, ask and apply legitimately to the Sheriff Court to develop it um, for the benefit of the community. We're underway with that at the moment, and that petition will be getting submitted hopefully before Christmas. So in terms of um, the previous approach to that, that has been updated with new land legislation. Yeah, and um, just as I say, I, I think we have made huge progress. I mean, this council is very committed to uh, delivering education, even in uh, straight and financial times as we are. So I think as an education committee, we should be very proud of the uh, the work which has been going on in terms of the Dumfries Learning Town and also the, uh, the Dal Beaky uh, Learning Campus once again. Um, we visited that on uh, Friday, and it's amazing the, uh, the progress that's been made in the seven months when they've, since they actually laid the, uh, the concrete um, slab it's um, certainly well worth visiting if uh, any member wishes to, uh, to have a look at that. And uh, in particular, it's a design which is very similar to the North West Campus, so it gives you a, a, a glimpse into the future as to what we hope will be seen up at uh, Lockside. Ivor? Chair, just wondering if there's any work being done on Phase 2, because we've had some contact from residents near Dumfries High School who are wondering what's happening there. Uh, is that work in progress and will come, what sort of stage will we see, uh, hopefully, bids coming for that as well, maybe into the next council, though? I think it probably will be into the next council. Claire? Yeah, um, work has been continued developing a business case and the, the design and details for the Phase 2 projects, but this committee will remember that that, that programme is not currently funded at the moment, so... Um, we really want to take them up to a stage where they are shovel ready in terms of being able to progress. We continue to engage with the school communities and we have met local residents at the North East Campus to alleviate them of any concerns that they may have. 
yeah, I think it's him. Andy. Thanks. Um, just through you, Chair, just may ask Frank how long the pylon's got to continue at, uh, at the uh, the new campus in North Western Freeze. Yeah, Chair, the, the piling is currently ahead of programme. Uh, I'm happy to report, uh, and we aspire to have the piling complete this side of Christmas, which is some two, two months ahead of programme. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just a couple of questions. Notice that financial closing St George College project was written the 18th of June this year. Uh, however, there's not actually anything in the paper that tells me what the cost of that is. Uh, and also, <coughs> what is the current estimated cost of the cost of the bridge that we have at the minute? I've confirmed, Councillor, that both the costs for St Joseph's and the bridge are as per um, committee agreed in terms of affordability cap. Um, so there's no there's no cost variances to what's been reported and agreed in the capital um, program. Yeah, I take it that was as was agreed at. To this committee in June 2016, uh, because the cost that's mentioned in here for the hub is no the cost that was mentioned. Sorry, for the northwest hub is no the cost that was mentioned in the report in June 2016. It rose by over one million pound. The difference between the two costs that's quoted in the two reports. I can double check them, but there's certainly been any cost variance beyond what we've been agreed as committee. But I can I can do a table to compare and check those for you. No one else indicating so running. Just just about uh, the phase two. You know, I don't know whether it'd be worthwhile. You know, approaching um, you know John Swinney, the new education minister. To maybe come down and visit and see the progress that's being made, you know, and don't be in, uh, you know, and we might ask some, you know, put a wee feelers out for some more money for phase two. So we could, uh, I don't know whether you want to add that in, you know, maybe to ask them to come down and visit. It's a positive story, you know, a positive story for Dumfries Learning Town. And yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to, uh, to write to the Cabinet Secretary and invite him to come down and see the progress which is being made, and, uh, as you say, both uh, within the Learning Town and the Dalbiti Learning Campus, and um, to get his uh, assistance with delivering Phase 2, because we do have to remember this is a two-phase uh, project, and uh, we will need uh, the Scottish Government to participate uh, fully in the, uh, the second phase, so yes. I'm happy to, to write to the Cabinet Secretary and we'll put that in as an uh, additional recommendation. So if we can move to the, uh, the recommendations, can we note 2.1, the progress with St. Joseph's College? 2.2, note the progress of Northwest Campus. Uh, 2.3, we received a verbal update from the Missdale Area Committee who are still awaiting uh, further information uh, prior to recommending a new name. So that will come back to a future meeting of the, uh, um, the CIPL committee. 2.4, note the progress of the bridge. And 2.5, uh, to write to John Swinney, inviting him to visit the um, uh, Dumfries Learning Town project and the uh, Dumfries, uh, sorry, the Dalbiti Learning Campus. Would you happy with that? Okay. Thank you. And it just so happens that item uh, nine is the Dalbiti Learning Campus update report, and it's clear to speak to this again. We, don't have, anything, don't, we don't have anything further to add than what you've, yeah. you've already okay. said. Okay, members. Rob. Thank you, Chairman. Members who are on um, this Dale Area Committee will probably see where I'm coming from with this one, but have we given any thought to how we're going to choose a name for the new campus? <laughs> Claire. Noted, Councillor, and um, yeah, lessons are learned. Um, we are meeting with the head teachers um, early in the new year, so we'll put that on the list of agenda items as part of the soft landing and take note of the um, elected member and community involvement in that. Thank you, Chairman, for the avoidance of doubt. I hope I'm not in need of memorialisation anytime soon. Gail? 
Chair, and it's just on that point, and it harks back to the last report as well. Why do they need different names? I mean, we, we didn't change the name of Lockerbie when, or Moffat when we built new PPP schools there. Why do they actually require a brand new name? And Northwest Campus seems to have been adopted already verbally by people in everyday use, and LBT Campus seems to be in common use as well. I don't understand the need for a, a fancy new name when we didn't do that with any of the PPP schools. I think, Chair Brown, just in terms of common sense, I think the Dobiti, both schools are called Dobiti, um, although one could, uh, yeah, but it makes it a bit more straightforward, although, of course, we have lost St Peter's. Um, so I don't know whether that needs any consideration or not. Um, the, the North West situation, I think, is quite different because you've got three schools all with different names coming together in the North, in the North West, but I think North West was probably a working title, uh, as is the bridge, for example, a working title and it is appropriate to go through a proper process to get the, a new name for these places. Okay. I think it's great that the hardest decision that we have to make is not being able to name a school. So no further questions on the uh, Dalbiti Learning Campus. So move to recommendations. And we've noted the progress with the Dalbiti Learning Campus project as detailed in the report. Okay. So effectively that ends the education part of the committee and I'd like to thank the, uh, um, the religious and education. Yeah, you, you can stay if you wish, but if you're leaving then uh, have a very good Christmas and a very happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we can move on to item 10, which is on page 149, DG1 project progress, and this is uh, Claire to speak to that one. Is there anything you want to add, Claire? Thanks, Chair, again. Um, we feel it's important, obviously, to do, um, report on this um, project, because it is at the hearts and minds of um, a lot of um, our people. Um, our key item for coming to the report today, as you'll recall, um, Back in the summer, we came to say about the design items that we wanted to progress, and quite rightly, you asked us to consult with users and public on that. We duly done that, um, and are seeking this papers, um, this papers, this, this board's permission to progress and explore these, um, delivering these design changes as detailed um, from paragraph 3.6. Um, but work is progressing on site. The contractors working hard in terms of um, program delivery and engaging with the community and promoting community benefits um, and working well with us. It is a very difficult job, as you're aware, um, but we have a very robust team who are challenging um, the process to make sure we get the right product with the right quality and the right time scale. So happy to take any questions on that. Members? No? Yeah. As I came past the, uh, the building this morning, the scaffolding was going up outside the, uh, the cupola, so uh, you know, it just make, looks as if it isn't making good progress uh, at this stage. So can we move to the, uh, the recommendations? Can we note 2.1? Sorry? It's just on the, the, the wooden cladding. I, I, just, uh, one of the comments from the, somebody who visited the, the thing is uh, it does not look good it only looks dirty and uncared for. Is it be replaced by an alternative? Because I have to agree with that. Um, we're really trying to secure value for money in every aspect of what we're doing here. It's not down for replacement, but it's down for remedial works in terms of where it's maybe not fit for purpose or quality and looking for a coating on it. So it will appear as a better quality product at the end of it, but we are not replacing it. So... Going back to the recommendations, can we uh, note 2.1, the progress within this report? Yep. 2.2, agree to amend the project brief to include the proposed design changes following public consultation. Uh, 2.3, note the feedback from the recent public consultations. Uh, 2.4, note the community benefits as detailed in paragraphs 316 to 320. Okay. Thank you. So if we uh, move to item 11 on page 161, 
Children, Young People and Lifelong Learning Services, Revenue Budget Monitoring Report 2016-17. The period ended 30th of September 2016. And we have Karen McNish and Colin uh, Pentland to speak to this. Is there anything you want to add to the report? Good afternoon. Uh, Appendix 1 has been re redistributed to assist members as it appears over two pages. Please note that the content has not changed uh, from the original report. Uh, this report provides an overview of the children, young people and lifelong uh, budget position at the end of September. This position is still broadly in line with the position reported to the committee in September. Overall, at this stage, it is assumed that a break-even position can be delivered for the service, despite the delivery of significant savings. There are a number of pressures within the budget, however, these are at a manageable level at this time. As reflected in the report, the service are making great progress in ensuring that savings required for 1617 are delivered as planned. At this stage, a small under-delivery in respect of children and families' payments is anticipated. However, all other savings are on track. All policy development initiatives are also being progressed as planned. Um, I'm happy to take any other questions. Chair. Members? No? no. So if we can move to the recommendations, can we note 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3? I thought it was going to be this easy how to cancel the sandwiches for tea. <laughs> I thought it was going to be this easy how to cancel the sandwiches. <laughs> okay, so if we can move to item 12. On page 179, the service review, service of the young people, and it's Mark to, uh, to speak to this. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the report that members have today uh, has uh, been the process of a year's work by a number of staff across the Council. Uh, and what we're proposing to members is a review that would offer an integrated service for young people uh, services across our, our council, which would maximise our people and our physical resources to ensure that we've got a service which is very much about the young people at the centre uh, and offers a parity of service across the Priest and Galloway for all our young people across our region. Uh, and uh, the, the report's very comprehensive in terms of the level of detail in it, and I'm happy to take any questions from members. Thanks, Mark. Members? Jim? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just in the first part, uh, the recommendations 2.3 were being asked to agree savings options. Uh, is that not just note the savings options summarised? Because it, it's part of the next year's budget process. Uh, also on page 211, uh, in paragraph 10.11.2, the last part right down at the bottom says, but act as a one-stop shop for young people to be able to access services within each, in each of the main population areas of our region. Definition of main population area. There are lots of definitions you could use. It could either be the recent strong or the two main population areas or it could be just the bigger towns, or it could be anything. So I would like to know the the actual definition we're going to use of the main population areas. And the my other question is on page 216, 11.5.2. Uh, At the bottom of there it says, total budget and scope is 27, 27,785,579. And it says that as detailed in 6.1, 6.1 actually says 28,549,512, whereas 3.4 in the report says 25.4 million. Now, I, I realise that uh, there's differences, but which one is it we're actually dealing with? Is it 4.1, is it 6.1, or is it 11.52? I'll give Mark a... A wee bit of time to uh, to look at the uh, figures. Thanks, uh, Chair. In terms of the, the the first point, in terms of the the areas uh, of 
uh, that, you know, that we're looking at in terms of providing a one-stop shop service. That what the report details uh, within that is that there would be an implementation team established, which would then look at uh, you know where the appropriate places for that would be uh, across the region to ensure. Uh, because what we're really trying to do with this report is ensure that we've got uh, an opportunity for young people to you know have a parity of service across the region when uh, perhaps uh, in the past in some services that maybe hasn't been the case. So. Uh, that certainly the implementation team would look to, to take that forward. Chair, if I can just highlight the, the, the difference for the number, certainly between 11.52 and 6.1, as the councillor points out, is that in 11.52, that's after we've taken out consideration of commissioning. It's no longer in the scope if you take the savings. So if you look, the difference in 6.1 is the commissioning figure of 760. No other members indicating they uh, wish to speak. So if we can move to the uh, recommendations. Marie? I think Jim brought up a point there about the recommendation about the agree the savings option as summarised. Did you want to come back on that, Jim? No. Sorry, Leader. I was thinking about something else. Though. I'm saying he brought up the he brought up the the, in the recommendations about 2.3 about agreeing rather than part of, being part of the budget process by noting them. Yeah, I would I would say note the savings options summarised and they'll be treated as part of the budget development process for 2017, much the same as we did with our previous, the previous report. I think in the, uh, the text it actually says the potential savings options, so note the potential savings options. Yeah. Check, check, I, think, check. I think we could agree that a part of the, the process. Chair, I suppose I would just say that as, as officers, we were trying to make sure that the gap is as small as possible that you're going to have to consider in the budget setting process. It's going to be enormous anyway. We did recognise that many of the, or at least some of the savings in the 2018 review are relatively contentious. That was why I would suggest that they would be in the budget setting process and fully accept the members wanted to look at all of those now in the budget setting process. These particular savings in terms of reduction in commission, we were pretty confident that we could achieve um, in a more straightforward way, and that would have, have saved you a further consideration of 250,000. But if that's what you would want to do, then we can treat it that way. It's, it's not a difficulty for us. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, and, and some of the bits here about the overall budget, uh, headings. Some of the areas that uh, uh, your massive department, Colin, actually get very specific money from uh, for, for very specific purposes. Um, how many of them are uh, touchable? I think is probably the answer. You know, if we've got specific active schools money or things like that, um, can we just get an idea? We, no, 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 right now, but even circulate around the groups. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly I'll get in contact with you and just clarify exactly what, what the question is and therefore what the answer would be. Okay. So if we can move to uh, the Gail. Chair, just very briefly, um, it goes back to Ivor's question earlier on. If we don't make a decision to agree those savings today, will it have an impact on the actual achievement of those savings? Certainly, in terms of the, the the savings, some of them do need a lead-in time in terms of delivering on some of those savings, particularly the the, the saving around the youth participation and youth democracy uh, part of it. So, it, 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 the the longer that decision takes, the more challenging it would be to achieve that saving in full from the first of April. Okay, so going to so, no, I think you know. But on that, on that basis, then, I mean, if, if you want to put it forward, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to get as much help for the officers to get choices and savings as well. Uh, however, recommendation one, which is to be brought in straight away, is the reduction 
and a 30% cut in funding to the revised commissioning budget. Uh, the question I had in that one is, what reductions to what services provided? I've got no information about who's going to get their their, uh, their budget that we give them for a commission service cut. I don't know what the outcome of that could be. How can I agree that cut right now? I don't think I can. Certainly, in, in terms of the, the commissioning budget that's within that, it, it's not any specific organisation that would uh, that, you know, that would be impacted in this on the basis of uh, that previous committees have agreed that we're moving to a commissioning process in place of our uh, strategic third sector grants and that uh, reduction in budget would be uh, essentially leave the officers with a, a level of budget in which to develop the commissions which meet with our council priorities and uh, with uh, you know the, the, the priorities that we have across the council. Jim. Uh, Chair, thanks for putting up with me today. 10.6.4 says there will be a reduction in services provided by the third sector. It says there will be a reduction in services. That's what the report says. I don't know what services. I don't know what the effect of that cut in services is going to be. Uh, I'm very loath to be agreeing cuts for next year budget right now. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, 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 Councillor, what we are referring to there is that if the budget is smaller than what it is this year, then naturally it needs to be a reduction in the amount of services. But because we are moving to a commissioning element around, you know, it's not a specific organisation, it's, we would need to agree and develop the commissions uh, from the 1st of April. And there is a seminar being held with all third sector organisations in mid-December uh, to discuss how that commissioning process going forward. Yeah, thanks, sir. I can only go with what's sitting in this paper. This paper says there's going to be a, a reduction in services. Until I know and see it in black and white, what that cut, or oh, a third in the funding, is going to mean I am not a mind to agree the savings right now. We consider them as part of the budget savings because they are savings for 1718's budget. And we get full details about what that actual cut of a third in the budget actually is. Mark? Yeah, I, th I think that if that's something that members want, that's certainly something that we, you know, we're able to do it, uh, you know, is to note the savings and bring it forward as part of the budget setting exercise. Chair, can I just add, though, um, again, we don't, there's no difficulty from officer point of view if that's deferred into the budget setting process, but in terms of managing expectations for members, it wouldn't be a case that even in a template that comes forward for your consideration, it's not the case that we're saying we're going to take 30% off of everybody who currently does things. What we're actually going to say is we're going to look at council priorities and commission based on those in the future. So there may still not be absolute clarity for you in terms of what that will look like in the future because the priorities have changed, but in the decision will be, do you feel, do you feel that we can afford to take a 30% cut in what we start off with? So I just want to be clear about what the template will look like for you, but that would still, could easily be considered as part of your budget consideration. Um, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, it was kind of part of my question that I was going to speak to you offline about, Colin, because uh, this, is a, this is a field or an area where some organisations are have a cocktail of funding which depends on each other. And that's what I was getting at because we need to understand that cocktail and how it works and what the knock-on effects are of any decision that we take might have on that other funding. So, for example, if we were to knock 10% of anyone's budget, would that mean the other funders would want to reciprocate, for example, and then all of a sudden you've got if there's another two funders, all of a sudden you've got a 30% knock in that budget, overall budget for that organisation. So we need to understand the whole picture about all these commission services, and that includes, um, you know, their external funding sources as well. I, I, know, I know Mark's steeped in that, and uh, it, no doubt he's got that at his fingertips, but I would, you know, get something down in writing would be really helpful. 
Councillor Ferguson, I know a number of organisations, uh, you know, that currently receive third sector grants do match uh, the, the council's funding with those grants. But these organisations are aware that the rollover grants, which have been rolled over for a number of years, were coming to an end the 31st of March. Been a lot of engagement done with these organisations, accumulate with the the seminar uh, next week, and uh, you know, and we've been working very proactively with organisations. Uh, around that, but by moving to commissioning as opposed to a grants programme, the, the current recipients of those grants you know, are not necessarily guaranteed either to, to be a recipient of a commission, which essentially is a tender process, and we're working very proactively with our local org organisations and groups to ensure they're in a, a very uh, strong position to, to, to tender for that work going ahead. Uh, th th thanks, Chair. Yeah, but the, the other bit I'm, I'm really keen on here is we, we need to be um, seen to be at, at the forefront and driving the whole thing here because our timetables and the grant giving timetables from big big organisations don't always run side by side. They, they cut across each other and we need, to, this is the kind of information I'm looking for because we need to have that information before we make any decision on any, any funding, whether it's the area committee or wherever it might be. If, if the the grant application timetable, for example, to, to rank or to the TSB Foundation or whatever, cuts comes before we make a decision, and we and they haven't got a, a statutory sector uh, commitment of any description. Uh, they often say, "Sorry, we can't support," and all of a sudden the whole project's in danger, not just a part of it. So I think this is the kind of information that I, I, I'm getting at here. See, Mark was kind of nodding there, so he knows exactly what I'm getting at here, and it's how do how do members get a full picture? So when, before we make any decisions whatsoever about any of these groups, we know what we're dealing with. Certainly, Councillor Ferguson, we can work with colleagues from the external funding unit of the council to, to see if we can get that information and share it with all members. I know I didn't get a second, but I did move a motion, um, and it's formed on the basis that we're at get real points. We're going to have to make massive decisions in February. We need to start making them now. We've done it previously in December. Um, they're not easy decisions to make, and I appreciate that. But on page 216, just below the box, 11.5.3, it gives a rationale with some very poor typos in it, I might add, um, as to why the savings recommendations are palatable and, and achievable. And then again at 11.5, again with typos, but I'll ignore them. Um, and I think we're just at get real point. If these savings are achievable today, we need to start to implement them so that we can actually see the full cost savings in that financial year, rather than delaying and delaying and delaying until February and still sitting making the same decision, but not able to implement it and maybe not being able to achieve it. So as I say, it's get real time. Gloves are off, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm quite happy to second it. I just want, I mean, I think what Jim's asking for is at 2.3, it's just to know, but I mean, I, I agree with Jim in principle, but at the same time, I'm, I'm a champion when it comes to commissioning and delivery, and I believe very much in, in this process that's been put in front of us, so I'd find it difficult to, to go against the recommendations. It doesn't mean that there's got to be any actual cut in service, this is how I'm reading it, it could actually be an improvement in service, but it's, if, it's, if it's what's been said and been outlined that it's previously, it's through the grant system, I understand that totally, so it is ad hoc, people didn't have a level of certainty. Commission, it's probably over a three to five year basis, I would think. Might be a year to year uh, service level agreement or contractual agreement, but I very much agree with if, if as Mark's outlined, it sounds like it's probably like a three year commission. I would imagine that'll be in place. So we could actually end up with a better service for less money. So that's why I, I would support that we do agree this and get this into place. But we're only, but we're not actually agreeing to a, a reduction in budget or, or an over provision in budget. We're just agreeing to a level, there's a some figure. And we expect uh, the, the, the services that, that could deliver on the back of that through a commission and uh, a commission service align more to our arts with our four, I suppose, predominantly uh, priorities within the council. I agree with that principle. I, I, I wouldn't move away from that. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, recommendation one saving 139,179 to implement it from. The 1st of April 2017. We may well end up with better services, more aligned to council priorities, but I don't know that at this minute. 
And that 139,000 is being, if we decide to agree it, is being removed today from next year's budget. And we've already heard that there will be organisations whose services will no longer be uh, commissioned by us. But I'm not being told today which ones they are and what they actually do. So the, the services will be reduced with a cut in 139,000. And it is a cut, 139,000, that we are agreeing today if that is what happens. So your amendment is? Yes, yeah, Chair, my, my amendment would be note the proposed saving options summarised in paragraph 11 will be considered as part of the budget development process for 2017-18 along similar lines as what we agreed in previous reports. Happy signed. <coughs> just on uh, and, um, what Andy's saying, would there be anything to stop, you know, if it was decided today and, you know, another group came forward with a budget proposal that, you know, overturned that if you want or wanted to put more money in for commissioning that through their budget process, would there be anything to stop any group doing that? Even on, and it would give us some kind of stability if there was a decision taken today. And the, it would also give, you know, if any, any group or anybody wanted to put forward a proposal on their budget to, you know, give more money to that, that would be up to them. Would, would there be anything to stop that? No. I think the six months rule has to be asked at that point. I mean, I think it's a, we're looking at one particular thing here potentially, but... We have got a six-month timeline in place, so it's potentially a governance issue. Maybe not, as Ronnie's indicating, so he's maybe got that background information yeah, I, already. I, I, I don't think you're overturning a decision. Yeah. 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 Right, so we have a, uh, a motion, an amendment. Lucy? Okay, we have a motion put forward by Councillor McGregor and it's been seconded by Councillor Blake and that's to go with the recommendation as per the report which is to agree the savings options summarised in paragraph 11 as part of the budget development process 2017 stroke 18 and we have an amendment put forward by Councillor McClung and seconded by Councillor Ferguson and that is to note the proposed savings option summarised in paragraph 11 as part of the budget development process 2017 stroke 18. Colin, is this for clarification? Just briefly, I, I mean in 11.5.1, in the first one, 139,179, very specific figure. So, it, I mean, it must have been arrived at by looking at various possibilities. So why are these actually not, I have to agree with Councillor McComb, why are these not in front of us now? I mean, you can't actually just say we're going to cut £140,000 out of a budget and have no idea where these cuts are going to be. Um, I just find it sort of strange that there's no detail in that and, it, and it's something that, that should be there. Well, we've actually started the voting process, so you've missed the opportunity of raising that, so if we can go to the, uh, the vote. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Brodie. Amendment. Councillor Ian Crothers. Motion. Councillor Karen Crothers. Motion. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Motion. Councillor McClung. Amendment. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor Nicholson. <coughs> Councillor Stitt. Councillor Thompson. Motion. Councillor Wiper. Amendment. And Councillor Ferguson. Amendment.
And I can confirm that the motion carries with 10 votes to 5 and members have therefore agreed the savings options summarised in paragraph 11 as part of the budget development process 2017 stroke 18. Okay. Members, so if we move to item 13, which is on page 495. All right. Yep. Okay, can we go back? Uh, Lucy, just remind, remind me, we haven't actually done 2.1 2.2. So, can we acknowledge the work undertaken to complete the service review for services for young people? And can we agree the review team's recommendation of option three? And 2.3 is what we had the vote on. Okay, so moving to uh, page 495, uh, it's item 13, and we have uh, Lee, Lee Seaton to, uh, to speak to it. Uh, it's the fitness membership review, leisure uh, facilities, and some preventers presenters with uh, the results to date of the pilot membership scheme operating leisure and sport facilities where business need for change was evidence. Lee, anything you want to add? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, as, as, as outlined, the, the report in front of you provides uh, an update on progress with the reduced cost health and fitness membership previously agreed through um, the, the then parent committee of community and customer services. Um, for a reduced cost health and fitness membership at targeted leisure facilities across our region. The early results you'll see from the report are positive. We have increased our membership, um, exceeded the initial targets, albeit we're in very early stages. Um, it is intended that the full results of the cost model, the new approach, um, would be considered as part of the wider service review on charging for services. Happy, happy to take questions, Chair. Members? A number of memberships, especially at Newington. Okay. Ian? I would echo his sentiments, I think, just as easy as way to put it. I mean, it is when you see it, the figures are quite outstanding, aren't they, compared to the previous targets. So no, just to congratulate on, on, on the, the uptake, the, again, and obviously the, the, the incentives that you're putting in place. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's <coughs> good to see that the attendances are going up with the reduction that was taken. However, we'll have got other sports centres and leisure centres across this region. I've had more than one individual from across my way complaining that they're paying for more. They're paying more than what they are in Dumfries. That's no fair. It's no equitable. Thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely note, note the point from, from, from the member. When the rationale was introduced at the, at the previous committee, it was on the basis of the leisure sites that would pilot this model were those that had reducing membership at that time. Um, a number of sites didn't and were performing well, subject to a number of factors. Um, clearly, the results we've now got, we have got an evidence base that would strongly support a rollout across wider facilities, and that's certainly part of what we're feeding into the Charging for Services review. Okay, so if we can move to the, sorry. Andy. Um, I'm, I'm a bit at a loss here something because table one has shown Newington is a downward trend. I, yeah, but that's right up to the thing, the 2016. Yeah. And then the next one's only for three months. Right, okay. Um, maybe just getting old. <laughs> okay, members, if we move to the uh, recommendation, can we note 2.1 and note 2.2? Okay. All right, I've no further business. So uh, have a very good Christmas and a very happy new year.